Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I want to welcome you today to our midweek video. We appreciate you uh, tuning in. If you uh, haven't already done so, if you consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell here on our YouTube page, we would uh, certainly appreciate having you to be a part of our uh, permanent ministry. Hey, I have a goal that I want to present to everybody. I'd like to see us get to 3,000 subscribers by the end of 2022. So if you're enjoying the content that you're getting in this channel, you know, you obviously don't have to agree with all of it. But if you're finding it interesting and uh, you are uh, definitely feeling encouraged or edified, would, would you consider sharing our channel with somebody else and uh, asking them to subscribe? If you, you can do that by leaving a comment, sharing our videos, we would certainly appreciate you uh, helping us get the word out. I'd like to reach a goal of 3000 subscribers by the end of 2022. We want to. We're all glad as always that you're here. We appreciate you supporting our channel, uh, and any other ways that you can support the ministry are obviously encouraged. Uh, along those lines, our featured book for the month of August is my booklet, "The Preservation of God's Word: A Close Look at Psalm 12, 6, and 7." This booklet, as the title suggests, looks at uh, Psalm 12, 6, and 7, and the somewhat of the controversy surrounding that passage, and whether or not. The passage is teaching the preservation of God's word or God's people. And so I take the position that it's preservation of the word of God, as the title suggests, but have a little bit of a different take on that maybe than uh, what you might be used to. So if you're interested, please check that out as a way of supporting the ministry. I also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here. If you're into alt tech sites or like an alternative to YouTube, please consider subscribing and joining us here on Rumble um, as an alternative to YouTube as I know there are some people that are looking for uh, those types of alternatives. So of late, in these midweek uh, videos, we've been in this series right here, Why Grammar Matters, and there are currently three videos in this playlist, all right? In the first video, we talked about God was in Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.19, understanding the imperfect tense. In the second video, we talked about not imputing in 2 Corinthians 5.19, and we discussed the relation between the imperfect and the present tense. And then last week in our video, Might Be Made, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, we talked about the aorist tense and the subjunctive mood. Uh, in this video, we're not necessarily going to be talking about a technicality of grammar. We're just going to be looking at, you know, why it is important to sort of uh, understand things uh, in their proper context. And we want to start by looking at this idea here uh, in Rome, in, sorry, in Acts 13, related to the issue and the connection between forgiveness and and justification. So if you've been following this channel for any length of time, you know that I've talked about this a lot, and that is there's an idea that is out there that many seem to be embracing that all that everyone is forgiven, but not justified. And that forgiveness and justification are two wholly different things. There is a verse here in Acts 13 when Paul is uh, preaching on his first apostolic journey that connects the issues of forgiveness and justification. So look here at verse 38, be it, known there, be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, through Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. So Paul is preaching, the, he's pre, through Christ, Paul is preaching the forgiveness of sins, and that by him, that's Christ, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. So notice there's a connection in this context between the issue of forgiveness and justification. Now, what some will say, again, is that while you, all the world is automatically forgiven, they were all forgiven at the cross, but not everyone is justified or not everyone is saved, and you believe Paul's gospel in order to be justified. The thing I would like to point out here, though, is that these two verses, they link forgiveness with justification. And you need to note that justified from all things in verse 39 is pointing back to the forgiveness of sins in the previous verse, and it is only those who believe who are justified and forgiven. Now, I've made a video here um, on number five in this series, response to Truth Time Radio's blog, Noah Webster, the Calvinist King James Bible Corrector, why write it, in which I spent a lot of time showing that 
you cannot be forgiven without being justified, and that to be justified means to be forgiven, and that the words, by, by meaning and usage of the word, you cannot be one without the other, okay? And here we see Paul in Acts 13, and he's basically making that exact point, all right? The justified from all things is pointing back to the forgiveness, having the forgiveness of sins, and this is this is only related to those who believe. You have to believe Christ died on the cross for your sin, was buried and rose again in order to be justified and forgiven. People are not automatically born into this world in a state of forgiveness, okay? That is just not the case. And we've already dealt with that when we went through the previous three videos in this series. So this is building off of that. So there's some things that I'm saying right now that if you're like, well, gee, why would you say that? You need to go back and get the information from the previous three videos. Where I'm at right now in this series is I'm not intending to repeat everything I said in these other three, but I'm trying to build on that as we work our way forward here. Okay, so we need to understand that to be forgiven is to be justified. To be justified is to be forgiven by meaning and usage of the words. And in this video right here that I have on the screen, I went through all of that, and we went through the historical meaning and usage of the word justified all the way back to Wycliffe through uh, William Tyndall, Martin Luther. We looked at it in the sermons of the King James Bible's translators themselves, most notably John Le John Reynolds and Lancelot Andrews. We looked at English language uh, resources from the late 16th and early 17th centuries when the King James Bible was being produced, and we saw very clearly that justification means meant to be forgiven and those words were synonymous with each other they were being used to describe the same thing and we need to see that here when we look at at the book of acts but i also want to go over to this verse right here which is another verse and passage that often comes up in this passage paul is recounting things here in acts 26 that happened to him back in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus. So it's later in Paul's life and ministry, and he's looking back on what occurred in Acts 9, and he's giving details about what occurred in Acts 9 that are not explicitly given in, in Acts 9. So Paul is filling out the picture, if you will, of what occurred in Acts 9 by his testimony here in Acts 26. And notice notice uh, some things about this, okay? So it's very clear that this is the con that the context here is on the road to Damascus. We can go up here, and Paul says in Acts twenty six twelve, uh, whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. Well, we know that that occurred in Acts chapter uh, nine, uh, etc. So this is Paul again filling in the skeleton outline of what happened, and then we can come down and. Christ says, "But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister." and to witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things which I will yet appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee. So Paul knows he is sent to the Gentiles immediately while he is on the Damascus road. This is not information that he got some point later. He knows on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, based upon his own testimony here in Acts 26, that he is being sent to the Gentiles right at that point. Now, it takes some time for that to develop in the book of Acts, but Paul knows that he has a Gentile apostleship and ministry from day one on the road to Damascus. Now, that doesn't mean that he has full understanding of the revelation of the mystery, etc., on the road to Damascus. It just means that God told him, look, I'm sending you to the Gentiles right from day one on the road to Damascus delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee. Now watch. So why is he sending them to the Gentiles? To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. So the Gentiles were in darkness. God is sending Paul. Christ is sending Paul to the Gentiles for the purpose of turning them from darkness to light. So they were currently in darkness. They needed light. All right, and from the power of Satan under unto God. So in their state of darkness, they were under the power of Satan. Okay, this reminds me of Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us, believers, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So 
The Gentiles were in darkness. They needed to turn from darkness to light. And in doing that, secondly, and from the power of Satan unto God. So a Gentile who is in darkness is living under the jurisdiction and the domain of the adversary, and he needs to be taken out of that. He needs to be delivered from the power of darkness, okay, in, for, in Colossians 1.13. So notice, to open their eyes, so they're, they're blinded, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. So Paul is sent to the Gentiles to, to, number one, open their eyes, to, number two, turn them from darkness to light, to, number three, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. That they may receive the forgiveness of sins. Now look, folks, basic reading says that if their eyes are closed, that if they are in darkness, if they are under the power of Satan, and the reason that God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Godhead, is sending Paul to the Gentiles is to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness, and to release them from the power of Satan, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, then it's pretty obvious that they don't automatically have the forgiveness of sins. This verse is not saying that they receive what they that what they already have. This verse is saying that they don't have it and they need to receive it. Now, look, I saw a video recently where somebody was saying that, well, receive means to believe. Yes, it is true. So here's the Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language. Receive can mean to believe all the way down at the 16th meaning of it. So there are more meanings and connotations of the word receive that deal with receiving something than the idea of believing. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about them receiving something. Now watch that they may receive. So if they may, so Paul is sent to them to open their eyes. They clearly were blinded. Their eyes were blinded from the truth of the gospel. They were in darkness and needed to be turned to from darkness to light. They were under the power of Satan, and they clearly didn't have in that state of being under darkness and under the power of Satan and blinded. They did not have the forgiveness of sins. Paul's being sent to them with the truth of the gospel so that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. The receiving of the forgiveness of sins is explicitly tied to faith. Faith in Christ. Faith in the work of Christ. So we got to be really careful here. And, and so what happens is, if we look at what we've seen in this, uh, in this particular series here of Why Grammar Matters, what happens is if, if you have a if you have a poor understanding of a, of, of a certain set of verses in a particular context, then what happens is you read that into all the verses that are related to that, and it cascades across your interpretation of all of the verses that are related to a given topic or to a given subject. It is very clear to me. Now, let's, let's look at the case of the Thessalonians, okay? So the Thessalonians were Gentiles. They were in darkness. They were under the power of Satan. They were blinded. Notice what Paul says to him in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. For they, that, for they themselves saw of us what manner of entering in we had among you, how that ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. So when the, when the Thessalonians were literally worshiping idols and they were the enemies of God, they didn't want God. They didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. All of the all of the categorical qualifications of Romans one applied to these Thessalonians. Are we to believe that they were forgiven? That they had that all of their sins were forgiven while they are under the power of darkness, while they are blinded, while they are under the power of Satan, and serving were and worshiping idols. 
before they heard the gospel, before they heard the truth that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again, while they were in that that state of Gentile rebellion in their thinking and 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 serving gods that are by nature not gods, gods made with hands, um, that are and, and worshiping the creature more than the creator, while they are actively engaged in um, idol worship, are we to believe that their sins were forgiven? See, for me and for many others, that is a theological non-starter to say that men are born into this life in a state of automatic forgiveness, redemption, and reconciliation. When you look at all of these other verses that explain this condition and state of the Gentiles, that they're blinded, and that's why they need the gospel. And the gospel is not, oh, hey, you guys are automatic. You guys are all, all automatically forgiven. No, the gospel is you are dead in trespasses and sins. The wrath of God is abiding upon you as a result of that. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And so what you need to do is you need to trust the gospel. You need to believe Christ died for your sins. Stop relying on your own ability, your own performance, your own religious law keeping, your own ability to make you righteous before uh, and all before righteous and holy God, and reach out by faith to the provision that was made for you by Jesus Christ. Okay, these Gentiles, these Thessalonians, they turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Exactly what Paul's ministry is said to be here in Acts twenty six, and they are. They receive the forgiveness of sins by faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now, one more thing to think about here. If it is true that all the world is automatically forgiven, then when exactly, let's look here at some things about uh, Romans 6, verse, Romans 6, verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. So if the Romans were automatically forgiven at the cross, when exactly were they the servants of sin? When were the Romans the servants of sin if they were if they were born into this life in a state of automatic forgiveness? It doesn't make sense, folks. The reality is is that the Romans and all the rest of the world are sinners and have fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't make any sense to say that they're born into this life, into a state of automatic forgiveness, when Paul says, God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Before they were saved, they were the servants of sin. But ye obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, being then made free from sin. See, they weren't free from sin until they believed God the doctrine, until they believe the gospel, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. How could they be the servants of sin and be forgiven of their sin? When we have verses like this that says that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. The most common natural reading of this verse is exactly the way that you would read it. And that is to say, they, the Gentiles are blinded. The Gentiles are in darkness. The Gentiles are under the power of Satan. Paul is sent to them bearing the gospel of Jesus Christ that they may receive the forgiveness of sins because while they are blinded in darkness and under the power of Satan, they're not forgiven. And oh, by the way, Paul explicitly tells these Romans that they were at one point the servants of sin ye were free from righteousness. How, when exactly were the Romans the servants of sin if they were born into this life automatically with their sins forgiven? See, if again, if folks want to believe in the forgiven, reconciled, 
and redeemed lost, they're free to believe what they want. But for others of us, it is a nonsensical, theological non-starter to say that. And it does impact what you tell somebody when it comes to the issue of the truth of the gospel. Do I tell somebody, listen, listen, but you're already forgiven. You just didn't know it. Now that you know, you need to believe the gospel. You need to trust Christ died for your sins in order to be saved and justified and sealed. Or do I say to somebody, hey, listen, you know, you're a sinner. The wages of sin is death. The wrath of God is abiding upon, which, by the way, is where Paul starts the, the great declaration of the gospel of Christ in Romans chapter 1 with the, with, with the expression that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. So, I mean, apparently there's, there's a problem there that, that people need to settle, according to Paul. So, if you want to believe in the forgiven, lost, if you want to be, believe in the forgiven, redeemed, and reconciled, lost, who also are left behind. So, understand that position maintains that there are people who are forgiven, redeemed, and reconciled who don't take place don't take part in the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 because they haven't believed that Jesus died and rose again, which 1 Thessalonians 4 explicitly makes clear as a prerequisite for, partic for participating in the catching up. So that, that's, that, that's sort of the state of, of, of things. When were the Romans the servants of sin if they were already forgiven? So look, folks, in, in, in any theological understanding, in any approach to Scripture, things have to be internally consistent and they need to make sense. And in this series, Why Grammar Matters, what I have endeavored to show is that the grammar matters in how we interpret passages. And if we, if we don't pay attention to these things and we uh, come to conclusions that are not consistent with the textual facts and the grammatical facts of a passage— they will have a cascade effect over everything else that we believe and that we teach in relationship to those things. So let me just be clear about it. I do not believe that the lost are already forgiven. I don't believe that those who are blinded, those who are under, those who are in darkness and those who are under the power of Satan automatically have their sins forgiven. That doesn't jive with a host of other things that Paul has to say about the state of the Gentiles, about their spiritual condition, about all sorts of other things, and the fact that Paul's explicitly sent to these folks, to these Gentiles, to open their eyes. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Satan has blinded their mind, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ should shine unto them, okay, to turn them from darkness, who have to, to light, who have who have delivered you from the power of darkness, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, and from the power of Satan, Ephesians chapter 1, the course of this world charted by the prince, the power of the air, among whom we all had our conversation in times past on the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So again, you're free to believe what you want, but not without consequence. We need to be careful. We need to be Bereans. Now, I'm not sitting here saying by any way, shape, manner, or form that I have everything figured out and that everything I have to say is 100% correct because I know that I am subject to correction and refinement and all of those things in my study and my process of the Word of God. But the grammar matters in that, in how we understand and how we interpret. And that has been one of my main focuses in doing this particular series of studies. So if you have enjoyed this series, if you've enjoyed this study, if you would consider liking it, sharing this video, leaving a comment, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell on our YouTube page as a way of staying current with the ministry, uh, we go live from the assembly building uh, at nine o'clock on Sunday morning and at 1040, nine o'clock with our adult Sunday school hour, 10 o'clock with our main service, where we are currently going through the book of Galatians. Um, I'm really excited about the Galatians series. I know some of you are following that series. We, we appreciate that. A reminder about our featured book for the month of August, my booklet, The Preservation of God's Word, a close look at Psalm 12, 6, and 7. 
And we are also rebroadcasting the Grace History Project on this channel every Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning at 9 a.m. We are currently up to well over about 120 videos in that particular series. Uh, so if you're interested in the study of church history from a uniquely Pauline perspective of the word rightly divided and a dispensational thought, you're definitely going to want to check out this series here, the Grace History Project. And we also want to invite you and remind you about our 2022 Bible Conference that we are having at the church. And our theme and topic this year is the weapons of our warfare, understanding the nature of our spiritual warfare. And again, that's October 21 through the 23rd at Grace Life Bible Church. There will be live streaming of that. I will leave a link in the description to this. It has the schedule for the entire weekend, all of the messages. These all start at East, uh, Eastern Standard Time in the United States. And we got Greg Reeser, we got Dave Reed, we got myself. The three R's, Reed, Reeser, and Ross, are going to be teaching this weekend. Should be a great time. If you are interested, please check out the link in the description here with this information. Before you go, also one last reminder about the podcast, the Just Grace of Podcast with my wife and I, and uh, we appreciate anybody who listens to that as well. I've given the gospel throughout this video, just simply stated, God loves you and Christ died for your sin. Stop relying on your own ability, your own law keeping, your own performance, your own ability to make God happy with you. Trust and rely exclusively on the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ his burial and resurrection as the only payment for your sin. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your attention.